Now, you all, um, you know about Chinese water torture? That it's after all the drops keep dropping in. So you may be subjecting yourselves to this with um, so much of me today. And I admire your, um, your endurance here. That, um, that we're going we're gonna to talk about um, the foundations. And I know I'm going to ask a question that there were, um, that in terms of, there were, there were handouts that had sections of the foundations. That, did any of you download those? Oh, that was like my, so, so we were going to figure out how this is all going to work here. And Mindy Brookshire is back there, and she knows them all by heart. And so that she's going um, to help us as we, as we move through this. OK, I'm, um, here's my topic today. Let's using early learning foundations and benchmarks, here we go, to meet children's diverse needs. And so that is um, it's what we're going to talk about, particularly taking some of the ideas that I talked about in the, in the keynote, but really begin to look at more in terms of how we use a tool to, um, to do that. And now I'm going to, um, I, I always have to tell stories, but that, um, that in terms of um, self-image, that um, I, one of my favorite stories is that I, I mentioned earlier that I've taught Sunday school for, for 33, 33 years and that um, I was in a grocery store. And in, in Sunday school, you do sing about God frequently. And so that is, and, and I'm not mentioning, mixing up church and state, but, but I do. And so I was in um, the grocery store in my neighborhood and I saw one of the families from my church and a two-year-old that I work with on Sundays. And she saw me. And she broke away from her parents, and she, um, and she came running down the aisle at the grocery store. And in a very loud voice, she yelled out, hi, God, hi, God. <laughs> and so um, my self-image in, just increased <laughs> tremendously. So, that, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not expecting you to leave here with that sort of self-image of me. But it was an interesting, it was an interesting lesson, again, for me about children being very concrete learners. And so that, and she only sees me one day a week. And that when she does see me, she hears me saying that name over and over and over. So she had made that connection. And so one of the things that is so amazing about the work we all do is that we, it is impossible to get inside the head of a two, three, and four year old. So we can study and learn. So we have to be good observers of them and try to learn what they're telling us. And this actually was a good example of the way she was learning and processing in her head there. And so that's what I'm going to, we're going to talk a lot today about the, the foundations and how they're a tool to help us do that. We're going to take a look. I have three, it's interesting in retrospect, that um, I see Mary Falvey over there. This is so funny. I didn't even think about this. I've got three videos to show you today, and they're all boys. And, so, yeah, so that, um, and if we look, as you all well know, in terms of percentages in special education, that uh, we do have a larger percentage there, which is an interesting thing to think about. But we're going to look at three little boys here today. And we're going to look at them from sort of different perspectives. We're going to look from different perspectives at those, at those three little boys. OK, we're going to. Um, I'm going to start here. And, and this term, accountability, and so that um, we hear about this a lot. I mean, we're hearing, you know, it's so interesting right now. We're hearing a lot about it nationally, about teacher evaluation. This whole issue about um, teacher evaluation and how can we be sure you know, that teachers are doing what they're supposed to be doing with our children. So how can early learning professionals be accountable for meeting the diverse needs of children. And so that I mentioned in one of the people that I've learned a lot of lessons from was the woman named Sue Bredekamp, one of the co-authors of Developmentally Appropriate Practice. And Sue, I went to a, um, a panel she was on several years ago. The, 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 po the topic of the panel was accountability. And so Sue got up to talk about accountability in early childhood, what we should be held accountable for. And so Sue said that as she was preparing for the panel, she started listing thing after thing that she thought early childhood teachers should do. She said, you know, there are all of these, all of these things that early childhood teachers should do. And then she said she looked at these multiple pages. And as she read them, she said she really realized that those multiple things that we should help be held accountable for kind of 
narrowed down to two items, two things, and these are the two things that Sue said we need to be accountable for. That is, what is the child learning? She said that when you, when that administrator comes into your classroom, that she said a legitimate essential question here is, what is the child learning? And so that, um, and so I, when Sue said that, I thought, can I answer that? You know, when I'm, um, when I'm with a group of children, you know, if I'm, um, if I'm on the, the floor with kids, that can I answer that? I, I thought, I immediately went to block play. And so I thought, um, if I'm sitting, you know, with the child on the block rug and we're in the child's building, that, um, that can I answer the question, what's the child learning? And I realized that I'm very good at saying, um, children develop spatial relationships through block play. Children develop math skills through block play. Children can understand shapes through block. And Sue said, that's not the question. I'm not asking what's the potential in all of that. I'm saying, what is that child learning? So do I really know that child and know what's going on to really be able to say, what is this child learning as they're, they're playing with those blocks? And then Sue said that there is an equally sort of essential question, and that is, what am I teaching? So that if the child's with the block play, and I'm saying, you know, these are the things that, that I can be, child can be learning or is learning, then the question is, how am I teaching that? How am I scaffolding that? How am I supporting it? Not just, you know, again, it's not just saying, I'm asking wonderful open-ended questions. You know, I know as an early childhood person, I'm supposed to ask open-ended questions. And then Sue said, but what's the particular open-ended question that's going to move this child ahead in their learning? And so that I thought a lot about that. They are two simple questions, but I think they say a lot about how difficult our work is. And that I honestly believe, I mean, it's like I, I don't mean to be a cheerleader here, but I do think that our foundations and our frameworks and our desired results in California give us great tools in terms of answering these questions, but we have to learn how to use them. I think that we've got the potential again in wonderful tools, but we have to figure out how, how to use them. And so um, here we go. We're going to sing another song. So. Um, I want you to think about, we're going to sing this song, and I want you to think, if you can, about some specific kids. Think about some children that you are either working with now or have worked with. And so we're going to sing this song, and I want you to think about those kids and think about this song and ask yourself those two questions. What's the child learning? So that um, what, what's going on or what could be going on in this song, particularly? And then what am I teaching? So what am I doing? We're going to sing the song together, and then I'm going to give you some time at your tables here to talk about these, these two questions. So here we go. And this is called My Mom Gave Me a Nickel. And again, this is not Vegas with me performing. This is a group activity. <laughs> this is a group activity. Here we go. My mom gave me a nickel to buy a pickle. I didn't buy a pickle. I bought some bubble gum, some bu 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 bubble gum. I bought some bubble gum, some bu 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 bubble gum. I bought some bubble gum. Okay, somebody else buy something different? Linda, what did you buy? A banana. My ma gave me a nickel to buy a pickle. I didn't buy a pickle. I bought a banana. A b -b -b banana. I bought a banana. A b -b -b banana. I bought a banana. Somebody else. A toy. My ma gave me a nickel to buy a pickle. I didn't buy a pickle. I bought a toy. A t t t t toy. I bought a toy. A t t t t toy. I bought a toy. One more. Ice cream. My ma gave me a nickel to buy a pickle. I didn't buy a pickle. I bought some ice cream. Some I I I I ice cream. I bought some ice cream. Some I I I I ice cream. I bought some ice cream. I have done this song for many years, and trust me, in a preschool class, 
children will quickly figure out, or a child will quickly figure out to ask for peanuts. So let's do it. My ma gave me a nickel to buy a pickle. I didn't buy a pickle. I bought some peanuts. Some pee 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 peanuts. I bought some peanuts. Some pee 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 peanuts. I bought some pee. It is tremendously satisfying to make everybody say pee pee in class. I mean, that is just like, what joy, you know, comes from that. So, okay, what I want you to think about are those two questions. Let me get them back up here. What is the child learning? What am I teaching? So at your tables, just take a few minutes here and think about some of the things that a child or some kids, you know, might be learning from this song. And then think about some ways that you would be teaching. And I'm not just saying sing in the song. You know, it's like, what are some of the ways, if these are the potential things that a child might be learning there, what are some of the specific strategies that you're doing as a teacher to help support that? So take a little while at your tables and you maybe want to jot some of those things down. <laughs> okay, let's, um, let's talk about, let me, put the, um, let me put the song back up there. Say, hey, what are some of the things that children might be learning? Somebody, don't be shy here. When they, the child chooses uh, different words that they bought, we're enunciating the first letter. So right. it's helping them learn the sounds of, of a letter. So beginning sounds. I mean, it is, I, I think it's one of the clearest sort of things in this song in terms of what kids might be, might be learning. And so that as they pick a different, different um, object or toy, there are those beginning sounds that you, can, um, that you can emphasize. Now, let's talk about if the beginning sounds like, okay, so that's something that a child or children might be learning through the song. Teaching, how are you, how are you teaching that? Okay, so let's, okay, here, that's good. So overemphasize. So one of the things is just within the context of the, that was good. <laughs> right, the, the overemphasize. So in the context of, of saying each letter, the p, -p, -p sound, or the t you're, you're overemphasizing the, the sound there. So the kids begin to obviously hear in a different way because of the emphasis on it. Other strategies around beginning sounds there. Yeah, but you do it over and over, right, so that you're not just, and, and we know it's one of the major teaching strategies with, with young children, one of the ways they learn there, and so that, so it is that repetition of, of that. Over here. Okay, I'm going to need to interrupt you, I'm sorry, We've because we it. need to have it on mic, because there's virtual people participating and they can't hear you. So you're also using um, multimodalities with include, including the kinesthetic and the vocal, and that's so important to really create that concrete yeah. So what sound. would you, let's talk about beginning sounds. So what's a way that you might do that? Within the multimodalities? Yeah, with some other modality there. Well, and it could be stomping. Right, so when you go to that beginning sound, mm -hmm. you might do a, mm -hmm. have a stomp mm -hmm. or an action that mm -hmm. would accompany that in terms mm -hmm. of the beginning sound. So again, emphasizing, but in a different way than just making it louder, but actually have a different modality that would go along with it. Other, other strategies? Anybody? Well, I have one, and that is one that I've, I think I was really guilty of, is stop and talk about it. <laughs> you know, and I think, I, I really, in, when I look back, I would have my five songs I was gonna sing. And so that in this song, that there was that beginning sound potential there, and so I would sing that song and know that it was there. And now I realize around intentional teaching, I can stop in the middle of that song, and like on the, I'll go with peanuts on the pee, 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 peanuts to stop. Listen to that. We were all going, look, pee, 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 and, and we can make that sound. Let's do that, pee, 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 and then, and then feel it in your mouth there. Go, pee, pee, pee. So again, stopping, intentionally talking about it, and teaching and emphasizing. It doesn't spoil the song. <laughs> and it's like, but it is, it's assuming I mean, it's not assuming that kids are all getting that beginning sound just because we went through the song. 
I mean, it's so interesting that there's, it's, it's not that different than a lot of the strategies we're talking about in terms of school age programs, pre-teaching and emphasizing, but we're, we're bringing it out, we're isolating it a little. We're stopping and we're isolating and we're emphasizing and we're repeating it. That way, the repetition, I can actually just repeat that sound over and over. So with t-t-t-t-toy, let's all say it again. T-t-t-t-toy, listen to that t-t-t sound. Yeah, feel it? You could really feel that one, you guys. Go. What's it feel like? Yeah, it feels like air or wind, doesn't it? So it's that emphasizing, the isolating, and the emphasizing. Okay, other things in the song besides beginning sounds. What could we be learning here? Rhythm. Rhythm, right. So, rhythm. yeah, so there is a rhythm and a beat to this, to this song. And so that in, in terms of what we know, in terms of language and literacy and the importance of, of rhythm there. So again, how are you, what are teaching strategies? If we're saying that children could be, could be learning rhythm through this song, what are some teaching strategies? Yes, I think here we talk about the multiple dialogue, the clapping, right? The clapping on the beat is clearly a way that we're emphasizing that. Other? One uh, would be the, the learning taking turns, and the other one that you mentioned earlier, beginning to be empower the children. Yes, absolutely. So that when we talk about other things that happen through this song, that we, that turn taking, I mean, it's like, which is a major um, it, thing that we're teaching. If you look at sort of like the foundations and desired results, turn taking, here's a wonderful opportunity to practice that. And also in terms of, like you said, self-image, empowering kids, empowering kids with it. So again, if we're talking about, um, about teaching strategies, so that if we, if we look at turn taking, and empowerment. What are some of the specific teaching strategies or scaffolding that you do to help kids learn that? It's like, it is not, you know, turn taking is not a natural, you know, like occurring thing in many children, as you well know. So how are we, how are some, what are some strategies to help kids learn that in a song like this? Okay, come on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Don't you love the virtual world, you guys? <laughs> um, I work with really small, I work with toddlers, like two-year-olds, so we're always working on turn-taking. Right. And for them, having an object, so they could pick an object out of a basket and then give it to me as we go through the song. And, which is a, one, I mean, a great strategy. And I've, actually, I've got to tell you that I work with a facilitator up in Oakland that does that a lot with adults. So that, um, so you have a ball that you throw, and so that it's who has the ball, that's their turn, and then they throw it to another person, and it's their turn. So a physical object that really does help you understand, it's, it's my turn, you know, and so that that pass, whether passing it or throwing it or whatever, is a way connecting that, it's a great strategy. And I think, again, infants and toddlers, but I think it's a good strategy along the age, the age continuum. Other strategies around turn taking. Well, one of the things we see a lot in, um, in early child classrooms is lists of children's names and, and um, clothespins and things like that, where you really are making this idea that you are, maybe it's not your turn this time, but you are going to get your turn. I mean, I think that assurance that you're, that you're not going to be left out. So there's all kinds of things with lists and names that you can do in terms of indicating in a visual way that there's going to be a, a turn that, that you have. Other, other ideas? Wait for the mic, please. Thank you. Sometimes we put numbers in a basket, and we let the children choose numbers, and then we let them count, and then that's how they take their turn also. Right, so, that, so, that, so that she has the numbers in the basket, and so they pull them out, and then it's like number one, is, you know, it's your turn now, and number two, and what, right? And so you have those numbers that the children, Linda. So one of the other things we can do is label it when they do it and say, oh, you took a turn. Now somebody else will have a turn. So we can actually be explicit about it. That is such a good one. And it was, I mean, I think they're all good, but that, that idea that it's, it's the, the idea of reflective, we talk a lot about reflective practice with adults. There's in, reflective practice with children. So in terms of being explicit about what just happened, 
And so bringing words to it, I mean, sometimes speech and language pathologists talk about mapping language onto what happened, but it's bringing words to it and saying, look, you took a turn. You know, as a poet, because like, what is a turn? I mean, you know, like we have all these words in our head that like, do, do, does a three-year-old know what that means, take a turn? And so when, you, when, you, when they take a turn and then you map language upon, it is clearly teaching it and reinforcing it in a, in a, in a way. That's a great one. So it's really helped. So what I'm saying is about all of this, it's like we need to be more intentional about our teaching. And so that it is, there's opportunities all day long, and it is tricky, I mean, it's a burden. <laughs> but that it is like we need to be thinking about that. And I'll tell you something, I do think that um, the more we sort of bring it into our consciousness, the more natural and automatic it becomes. And so that when you go to do a music time, if you really do think about you know, what's going to be, what's the potential here? What am I going to teach? One of the things that I have encouraged as a, as a professional development activity, think about a song that your children really like in your group and sit down as the adults and talk about what are all the things that kids are learning in this song. And it doesn't mean you're going to do that with every song you do every day. But I think doing that kind of analysis of a song and all the potential that's there is a helpful way to get you into the practice of the intentional sort of scaffolding. Okay, there are other things in this song. What, what other, we've got, we've had turn taking, we've had beginning sounds, we've had um, empowerment. What, what other things are happening in that song? I saw some teamwork and collaboration Right, and absolutely, so that, so, and I think that's interesting that it's a little different than turn-taking. And it's one of, I think, one of the powers of, of music is that coming together that I mentioned B. Gold, who was my first boss and who was a mentor to me, and she talked about coming together as a group and, and she said that there are two natural magnets that she thinks for bringing kids together. She said, music and food. <laughs> and so, that, so I think, Linda, your example of how to use those is that um, it, it's to talk about we're together as a group. So you really bring the description to it. And so at meal times, it's not just a time to get your food, but it's a time to come together. And we label it as such. We're all together at the table. We're eating. We're next to each other. All those ways that we talk about cooperation and groupness. And I think music is a way to do that as well. I, I, I've told people that if I go into a classroom and I go over on the rug and I start singing, I have a group of kids that, that come to me. And sometimes I think we pick, um, we may have an idea about, oh, this is going to be a great activity for, to bring kids together. You know, we've got this wonderful book or whatever. And it may not be such a magnet. And one of the things that B taught me is use those natural magnets to do lots of other things. So that because food is a natural magnet, look at all the teaching that can go on during mealtime. You know, this is not just the time when kids are, you know, getting their nutrition, but there's all kinds of teaching and instruction that can go on. And like I said, what I've learned from Dr. Espinosa and Elizabeth, use music for all kinds of content teaching. So that take, think about if you're doing some kind of a thematic unit or study, do songs and chants that are related to the content that you want, you want kids to get. And so there's all those opportunities there. Okay, other things in this song. Go oh, ahead, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, good thing. The children are learning what object and word correlation to the yeah. spoken word and object. Right, and, that, and there is, and I think that's, for me, that was like such an aha as I've gotten older, that the content in terms of the word, the vocabulary, and the object is we make all kinds of assumptions about kids that we, we sing a zillion songs and we think those kids know what all those words are and what they mean and we don't stop to do that kind of instruction. That um, I always tell the example of the Star Spangled Banner where uh, many young children think it says, Jose, can you see? I mean, it, it, it is not uncommon for kids to think it says Jose, especially in California, I think that they, they think that. And, that and, and how do we teach what it is? And so in this song, there is unbelievable vocabulary and content here. There is just a lot of vocabulary and content in this song. 
So if I'm a teacher and I've done this song and the potential is there for relating the word to the object, how am I, what are strategies, what are teaching strategies to do that? Having a basket of items. Yeah, <laughs> having the real object there, right. We have, you know, having the real object. And what we know about, um, that it's interesting that there's all this study in terms, especially like with language and literacy about sort of symbolic transformation, but it starts with the concrete. You know, it's like I, I always give the example of, um, and I may have it in here later, I think I do, but that of, of a dog. You know, and the word dog. Well, it starts by the child seeing a dog, you know, and then they may recognize a picture, you know, of, of a dog or a drawing of a dog. And then you get to that DOG over here. But you don't get to the DOG dog unless you've gone through those other steps. And so you start with the concrete. So in this song, and, and I think that we, we start with the concrete. And if we don't have the concrete, the pictures, you know, and whatever, but there are many ways that we can bring the, the realia to a song like this. So have a basket with different objects in it there that you're, you're talking about. Other? Uh, Pre-math skills, like you're teaching a unit on money, and you could do like many pen pennies, the concrete <laughs> five pennies equal a nickel. Absolutely. And what, what, that is, what I, what I love about what you just said is that, um, folks, there is, you know, I know, I know that we have these, all these lessons we're going to get through, but there's a potential there for a lot of teaching and learning from this one song and about the nickel and pennies. I mean, you know, it is, there's, there's a, um, a, a Bev Boss, who many of you know about, who is a wonderful preschool teacher, is the most, I've never seen anyone who does things like this, where kids get excited about a song like this. And then, and Bev follows their lead until they're building a grocery store and having pennies out there and they're going on for six weeks with it. But, but, and, but, but there is that great potential there and it doesn't mean that the, um, and what's, it's like connected learning, you know, and, that, and, and Common Core folks is all about connected learning and so when people talk about we want to be sort of, we want to be sure that we're aligned with Common Core, this is aligned with Common Core. That kind of connected learning is, is aligned there. And so that you, all kinds of potential for vocabulary and math and all of that that's through, through starts with this song and trying to help kids understand what a nickel is. Somebody here had their. I was just thinking, um, just having the words up so that pre-reading, that not necessarily to read the words, but to see them and um, so that children are beginning to know that the song, the object, also goes with the actual word. Okay, this is a, like a huge aha on, on my, my part. That, um, that I, you know, it was, there was a time, folks, and this is like Whit's True Confessions, when the parent of a three-year-old would come to me and say, I want you to teach my child how to read. And, and I would spend a great deal of my wonderful background in child development to explain how three-year-olds aren't going to be learning to read, how it's not developmentally appropriate. And so um, now I have a much deeper understanding of the continuum of language and literacy. And so that how do we begin to, to connect to that continuum, and how do we begin to look at print-rich environments and how we, how we connect with that. So that um, one of the things, and I don't think I have a marker here, but um, I'll, I'll tell you that, um, that one of the things I would do now in that song is when, we, um, is when someone picks something that we're gonna buy at the, at the store. So that, um, let's say that, that someone picked a ball, they were going to buy a ball at the store, and that, um, and we might talk about beep, 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 ball, you know, and then, and then what I would talk about is, you know, it's like, and then write that word up there, that's that word we just said, ba 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 ball, and that's the letter, I might underline that, that letter that makes that sound, that's the B, and you know what, folks, I would do that with two and three-year-olds, who, um, who aren't, I'm not going to turn to them and say, now, what's that word say up there? But I would do that with two and three-year-olds. And so that, and I didn't used to do that. 
didn't used to do that. I would have had the object and I would have done all of that, but I would have not done what I, what I just did then. And then what has helped me come to understand that is really thinking about um, language development and I think about babies. Think about babies. And I think about, any of you have a baby at home? No babies at home. Well, if you had a baby at home, and you were going to put that baby sleeper or pajamas on at night, trust me, you'd be saying, look at your pretty blue pajamas. I, you would be. Trust, you would be saying, oh my God, your pretty blue pajamas. Now, what you don't do is then say, now, what color are those pajamas? I mean, you know, it's like the, that six-month-old. Or, or you don't then hold up a blue pair of pajamas and a green pair of pajamas and say, point to the blue pajamas. <laughs> You know, but, that, but what you do is you talk about the, the blue ball and the blue pajamas and the blue car. And so the child is, is hearing that over and over, enriched in their life, all about the blue. Now, there's going to come a time cognitively where they're going to be able to make the connection, what we were talking about, between that word blue and that color blue. And I call that, and this, it, this, is, this is not fair to development, but the ahas that we have in life. You know, life development is a whole progression of ahas. You cannot have the aha to say that color is that word that mom and dad have been saying if mom and dad haven't been saying the word. You know, if, they, if it, mom and dad haven't been saying the word, I may very well pick this up and I could be ready to call this something. But if I haven't heard over and over about that color, I'm not going to be able to have that aha and make that connection. I think that is the same thing about this ball and about letters and about literacy. And all of you who have had children know this from reading those stories night after night and pointing out those words and the ch children following along in the letters. We are setting the stage. We're giving the ammunition. I hate to use that's bad, a bit mad. We're giving the fuel. We're giving the fuel for all of this to happen. So I think that, and it is not, again, that when you think about scaffolding, it's not to jump way over a child. It's not to ex the expectation, but it is the exposure. And it's the opportunities, and then the watching. I think that is so amazing. And like, with, I mean, I'll do you good night, moon, or what, you know? It's like watching what children are starting to do, which surprises us. Surprises is when they begin, you begin to see, you know, those, those, those oncoming skills. Larry Edelman, who's who at this, pre presenting at this conference, has a fantastic video that a teacher made of herself, and that it's of a child who's doing some copying of a, of a, a language experience story, and so that they have sentence strips. And so there's a language experience story, and it's down, she's put it down on the table, and the child is doing some copying of the story. And the teacher sees, you know, that, that the child is copying some words from it down here. And then she said that she thought, oh my, he's copying words. She got home that night, and she watched the video, and she said that she knows the child would look up at the story, and then would look down and would write three letters. So what she didn't realize that suddenly that child was seeing chunks of letters in words and literacy. And so that it was that, and that's what we're going to see. It doesn't mean that automatically this child is going to be understanding, you know, that this is the word ball or that's a B. But later, you're going to see him going over to Bobby and point to Bobby's name tag and said, that's the B. And so if we're not creating those opportunities for all of that to happen, we're not going to see it. In San Luis Obispo at, oh, help me, the, the Child Development Center at the community college there, which I love, they have a, um, they have a wall in the hall that's all between the classrooms, and that they have a letter wall. And the whole wall is like the, the 26 letters, and there's sections in, and the kids and parents would start putting pictures of things that go with that letter. And so this just, it's this great sort of free form collage of all of these things. And then you see kids as they begin to walk down that hall on their way to their classrooms and home pointing to those letters. Again, we are not saying that every two-year-old should be, we're not going to have, you know, on desired results, Mindy, it doesn't expect two-year-olds to identify the letter B. It does not. But, but what we're saying is that the enriched environment that's giving those opportunities is for all, 
all of our kids. <laughs> okay, that was enough preaching. No, they will not be identified Absolutely, and I, that's, that's what I'm saying, that if we don't give those enriched opportunities and do it in a way, this is, um, that, and that's why I like about this song, do it in a way that is meaningful for that child where they are developmentally. So that in the context of this song that's fun to sing, my putting that B up on the wall quickly, you know, in 25 seconds and saying it, isn't stopping the joy or the learning that's going on where they are developmentally, but it's enriching the activity with those opportunities. Okay, other things in this song. Okay, I'm gonna give, we talked about rhythm, but I'm gonna talk about the rhyming that's in here as well. So we've got um, nickel and pickle. And so that when you, again, when you look at the studies about literacy, whatever, there's a lot about, you know, hearing those rhymes, being able to, to hear those rhymes. So what are some teaching strategies about that? I think, again, it is a mistake to think that when you sing that song, that kids are automatically going to hear those rhymes. So, what, so again, what's our strategy on that? Stopping, right, pointing them out. So we're going to stop here and I'm going to say, let's stop. I had a nickel and I bought a pickle. Let's say those. Nickel, pickle. They said, listen to the sounds. Nickel, pickle. Nickel, pickle. Now, this is always interesting. Anything else that sounds like that? Tickle. Let's all, you know, we, so we've got nickel, pickle, tickle. And some of you in your dating life might have met someone that was fickle, fickle right? That's what I, <laughs> prickle, trickle. There's also, so again, it is, and one of the, I mean, it's interesting. Dr. Seuss discovered this long before I did. This leaving off the last rhyming word <laughs> is a great way for the brain to work a great way for the brain to work in terms of kids beginning to hear that rhyming sound by leaving off the, the rhyming word. You give the, the, the pretext gives the hint to it, and then just like with tickle would be an easy one in terms of getting kids to have the last word be, be tickle. So, or, or like, um, I'm trying to think here, help me Mary, so like, I was eating a pickle, and my mom came up and gave me a Tickle, right. So again, getting the brain to work here and, and moving ahead. Okay, so did I completely exhaust this song, do you think? That we, I think I've, I've squelched it completely. So let's, um, here is, okay, vocabulary, meaning, we talked about that, speech, language, rhyming sounds of language, beginning word sounds, letter sounds, turn taking and listening. I predicted you would get all of those, and you did. That was a, a good job. Okay, let's, let's move on here. Oh, sense of community group, we got every one of them. Okay, okay, here we go. Okay, how do we know what to do to meet the needs of each child? So that we talked in that activity about some potential and some potential ways of getting there, but how do we know when and what to use with each individual child? And so I wanna talk a little bit about how we, how we get there. Okay, we teach, Linda's seen this before, to meet the individual needs of our children. Watch this. And it's the each that we're trying to get to. So that it is that, um, that the each and teach is, how do we focus on the each and teach? And so I think that is, um, that's that, it's actually what B talked about with me in terms of more alike than different and all different. So how do we keep in touch with the idea that children are more alike than different, but each child has, has a need. I gotta tell you, there were a school district I was involved with had one of the, you know how we have these vision statements? And, that, um, and their vision statement was, are, we're going to meet the needs of all of our children. And one of the board members pushed, and they changed it, we're going to meet the needs of each of our children. And I think that that is an interesting concept and an interesting change in perspective. And the goal really is an inclusive program to meet the needs of each child. So here we go. The early childhood educator as decision maker. Now this again, this is completely stolen from Sue Bredekamp and Carol Koppel, so this is not an original idea. But this concept that you, we all are decision makers. We are not just implementers of curriculum. 
you know, that um, there is no such thing, and it used to irritate me completely, as a teacher-proof curriculum. <laughs> you know, that we are all the implementers that are going to make these, make these decisions. So here's, um, again, and I went through this in the keynote, those three things we're using to make decisions, age characteristics, individual variation, and culture and family. And so that those are the, that's, those are, that's the information we're getting the information we have to pursue to help us make those decisions. So here we go, okay. Observation is at the heart of our ability to juggle and effectively make these decisions to meet the needs of all children. You cannot be a good teacher. You cannot use desired results or the frameworks or the curriculum or the foundations if you're not a good observer of kids. It's impossible because you're never going to know which is what's going on with that child and how to implement and support their, support their learning. So we are going to, oh, a quote I love. This is from um, Judy Jablin. Meeting the needs of all children takes your head and your heart. And here's the quote. It says, it is the act of observing, of giving someone my attention and trying to understand them that opens my heart. As I observe, I begin to know a child, a feeling bridge is built. The details I observe start to come together and I begin to see what the child needs from me. It is this heart-head connection that I think is the joy of our work. You know, and it's like a lot of us have taken lots of child development classes where you do all these sort of intensive observations of kids and you may um, write down all your observations, you know, and, and you may even, you know, put down where you think they are in terms of desired results. The goal of that is not just to write down that information. The goal of that is to know the child. And so that connection, as you get deeper, as you use the foundations and desired results in deeper ways, it's not just a burden. It's not just a task. It's not just a report you have to do. It's a way to know a child and open your heart. And I think that head-heart connection, we have to keep telling ourselves over and over because sometimes it gets so tedious. You know, you think, why do I have to observe every single thing? It is by observing every single thing, by getting to know that child, that you're figuring out what they need from you, what, where they are, what they need from you, and how you're gonna, how you're gonna move them ahead. And um, that's from a book called The Power of Observation by Judy Jablin. And so we're gonna take a look at a little boy named Christopher. And so what I want you to do in this first observation is to, and this is, I'm gonna leave that, I thought, if you had all downloaded those things in your PowerPoints, we would be okay here. But, but think about this. So it's what you see and what you want to know. So if you kind of write, th write those two things down on a piece of paper there. So that, and if, you're, if you have your iPads, you can pull it up on your iPad there. But um, it's what you see and what you want to know. And think about it in terms of these domains, social, emotional, language, and literacy, and physical. So think about social, emotional, language, and literacy, and physical. And we're going to look at Christopher, and he's a lot of fun to take a look at, trust me. And so write down some of the things you, um, you see here with him. Now we'll see how which technology works here. How do I get it back? This. Yeah. Pull it back. And then put the volume back up. Thank you. And then just move the arrow and that'll go away. Put the arrow down. Thank you. Mike. Do it. Oh, the volume. Uh, survive. Uh, survive. Uh, survive. Uh, survive. Uh, survive. Uh,
Did we get the outsides? Look, look up. Did we get outsides? Yeah. Did we get insides? Yeah. Did we get the top? Yeah. Did we, did we get the top? I think we missed. When you wake up in the morning, it's a quarter to three. My insides humming, tweedly dee. You brush your teeth. Shh, shh, shh. You brush your teeth. Shh, shh, shh. Hey, let's get some <laughs> now do your tongue. When you wake up in the morning, it's a quarter to five. You just can't wait to come alive. You brush your teeth. You brush your teeth. 
Okay, so um, there's more of Christopher, but you saw, you saw some essential elements there. So I want you to think about social emotional development, language and literacy, and physical development. And take a little while, some, just some things you saw, and what you want to know. Because I think there's a lot of questions um, that, are, that are, arise up from that video. But just talk together about some of the things you saw in those, those developmental domains. And then some things you'd like to know about, about Christopher. Okay, so take a little while to, to work on that. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about Christopher here. So that um, some things that you saw and some things that you want to know. It's like that um, questions are um, going deeper or whatever things you want. So some of the things that you saw, what, did, what, what, what are your observations of Christopher? Back here. And hold on. Hold that, hold that, hold that. Hold that thought. So um, one of the things that we noticed was that he he seemed to be looking at the poster of the, the toothbrushing, but it was just this big open mouth with a disconnected toothbrush. And while that might work with some people, it seemed like he was like, okay, this is what I do. <laughs> <laughs> ah! And he got his own dance moves in there, which was great. But it, it's like, well, if, if he's using it, then give him all the other steps. Where is, are, are all the discrete little you know, steps of the toothbrushing tasks so he can follow from you know, wetting the toothbrush quickly? <laughs> Your quadrants of the mouth, you know, bottom, top, like all the things that she did after the fact, but set him up for success. You know, you want him to be independent with him, give him all the pieces that he needs. And, and I mean, of course, it was, I love that video. I mean, but he is like, you're right. He clearly is like, he's doing everything, but about what a foot out from his, um, <laughs> but about a foot out from his, from his mouth there. Yeah, so that what, um, so what are the strategies, whether those you know, be in terms of adult strategies or picture strategies or whatever, to help with that, to, to help in terms of make that clearer, clearer to him. Other, other things you, um, go. 
Just a quick comment on the toothbrush. I think if she, uh, if the teacher actually put the toothbrush in her mouth, because maybe he saw it from them teaching it outside, so maybe if she got her own toothbrush and put it in her mouth, and he would see that, oh, it has to go inside. And then the poster of the toothbrushing, it, you know, it just needs to go down so that he doesn't have to look all the way up. Right, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you're right. And so demonstration is one of the major teaching strategies we know, and so maybe in terms of a, of a, of a demo there. Any, yes. any other, go, go ahead, I'm oh. sorry. And then, um, uh, first it was just a few minutes of observation, but just, um, I think that if, if you were to observe a child really well, it, ha it would have to be longer. You have to oh, actually right. be there. Um, but from, from just looking yeah, at the, the video, yeah, it looks like um, he seems to be receptive to the teachers, and he seems to play well alone and also with others. And um, uh, because, you know, he shared the, uh, the toy, the tower right. with the other child, even though he gave him a different bat. And I would, uh, would want to know like, what his age is, because in terms of um, his speech, uh, I wouldn't like judge right away if he would need some. He would benefit from some sort of speech therapy, but maybe just sitting down with him and um, listening more, observing right. more, yep, learning more. Right. I mean, I, it, Sharon had a really. I'm going to tell your comment, Sharon, when you talked about the relationship with the teacher. She talked about the, which I, I think we had a signal how good it was, and Sharon pointed out that when the teacher put her hand on the back of it, that he was very comfortable with that. It was, you know, and because and some kids you would have clearly seen them pull away or resist at that point, but there was there was obviously a good relationship there because he he was fine with her, and that's that was very intimate, you know, that was that was very intimate there and, and holding his head there, and he seemed very um, really good good with that. Other I would. Um, well, it's interesting that I'm hearing these different comments because when uh, we, this is my group, we looked at it, we looked at the teacher and how she let him have his space and time because obviously he was singing the song, you know, everybody knows the song, Brush Your Teeth. Right. When you do that song, I don't know anybody who actually puts their finger in their mouth and does it. So he was imitating that and even though the picture or whatever, so she let him have that time and space to be able to move in his body and everything and express himself exactly. And then she came over to help him then in turn put the toothbrush in his mouth and let him brush his teeth. So I think it was a great experience for him to know that he has that time and space to be able to move his body and do those things when sometimes we don't always, you know, can let that child have that or, or do something like that. So it was, a, it was very nice to see that. That's really interesting, you guys, the, the two <laughs> points of view, which we don't know. But it was, was interesting, I mean, that's so fascinating because one of the things that we would, um, in, in terms of like the, the pictures and the demos, if you were in the class and knew that he knew how to do it, you know, had, had done it within his mouth, then, then, the, the, then this idea that he's having fun with it and singing the song and, and enjoy, you know, it's like a, it's, a, it's an enjoyable experience, gets much clearer because you know him and you know what, what he can do and not do, which you're right, you talked about too short a, a clip, but it is, it's like I think this perspective that the teacher is um, you know, allowing, letting him have that freedom to do that and not coming in right away and saying, no, that's not how you do it. I mean, I, I, that does ring, whether either perspective, I think I really like the fact that the teacher did allow him to have the, the, the whether he, uh, we don't know in terms of what his skill level is around, around toothbrushing at that point. Go ahead. I don't know if I need this, but um, my first inkling was he seems like a very happy child and that um, the teachers let him be who he is, even with circle time. He was able to finish cleaning up. He didn't sit in the circle, but he sat with the group and they allowed him to feel comfortable where he was. And just his, his happy social emotional um, on the outside, you could tell that he was, that the teachers were totally accepting of everything he does and allowed him to be who he was. So back there, someone comment on, you read. I saw a hand go up right away with that, so I wanted to hear. We, we had actually talked about that too, and we were wondering um, if it's something he's working on with teamwork and collaboration because he didn't participate in the circle, but he was in, he was participating at being there. 
his presence, but he wasn't actively engaging. So we, a question we wanted to know was, is that progress for him? Was yeah, he I, prior not there at all? I think that's a really, in, that's an important question in there is like, wh how does that fit? Because you're absolutely right, that, it, he, that he was sort of in, in the middle, but not in the circle. And the teacher was like, there was not a, there wasn't any kind of attempt at um, intervention. So is that like, is he working? Right, on? is it something he's working on? Right. And then uh, one of the things we talked about was he, he seemed to have really good, um, science concepts right so yeah, yeah. you know when he built his little catapult and then he yeah. understood and, and, that if he put it at a certain level it was going to go higher um and, and the then when he put when it was not balancing right and he put a second block on the end there right. to balance it was i thought very interesting you know he was really figuring out the the balance there and the way that it right. would, the leverage and whatever very interesting mm -hmm. i i do want to i i mean it's like because i think it's um so clear there it's like as ready as he was to share with the little boy, he did not like it when that little girl got involved in there. In it. <laughs> and it was like he just, whoa, you know, which I think is interesting to know more about him. Because that was, and, and I think, you know, that there was um, sort of like ready to, to pop there. And that, and that where I did, I, I, ha, I had a hunch, when we talk about what kind of interventions and progress have gone on, that that's been something that that teacher and staff have been working on him with. Go ahead. That's so funny, because that's what I was going to say next, is that even though he doesn't have that articulation yet of saying no, he went, ah. And right. that was his way of being like, don't you dare touch this block. This is yeah. my block, right? And he had that emotional self-regulation to really not, he doesn't have the words yet, but he said no, and she got it immediately. So that, to me, showed a lot yeah, right. of self-regulation. Yeah, and is any, any speech and language pathologist here in the, in the group? Um, just the, the, the question about whether he needs, he has an identification with a, with a speech and language, or he, he has an IEP, and so that that was, so he is getting, he is, but I, I, find, I find it fascinating, you know, that his, his use of language and what's going on there in terms of the, um, like you said, the, the, um, the articulation stuff that, that's happening there, I think, is, um, and clearly expressing his, um, he was very clear about that. I mean, that was a, a very, um, and she was very clear, too. I mean, it was like she backed right off when, um, which me led me to believe that maybe he's someone you don't mess with. Yeah. It is yeah. like that. <laughs> I mean, that, that I'm not a dummy here, you know. I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mess with him. I, I do want to, and I, if you look at the video, and I think this is an interesting, um, as we get to know children more, that um, as that circle time goes on, there is a, a sadness that starts. I see sadness on his face. And sort of there is a, and so it's like, I think he's a little boy with a lot going on, you know, and, and I think that, and I, and I think, you know, it's a staff that's really supporting him. Sharon. I was wondering about what seemed to be uh, either expressed or not anger. Right. That kind of coupled that. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, in terms of what we want to know in terms of, you know, who he is and what's going on and how he gets along. There's a lot, there's a lot there. It is like, um, there is such, I mean, I was, I was watching Mary Falvey watching this and she just had this huge grin on her face and I knew she wanted that boy in her classroom. <laughs> I mean, it's like, there's just a lot of, lot going on, a lot of brightness and interest and energy and, and so it is. Uh, and, and so what I'm saying is that, um, and you've all been clear about this. We saw a lot there, but we didn't see enough to talk about, you know, who he is or what we're going to do. And so I just want to go on now a little and talk about um, some ways that we can take our observations and move them ahead into more specific strategies here. So we saw that. So the question is, how do we know what to do with the observations of Christopher to help meet his needs? So, you know, it's like, so yeah, so we saw all those things, so what do we do with Christopher? So effective early childhood educators are always observing and reflecting on those observations. And so that um, what we just did, you all should be doing every day. And I know, and I'm going to say this right off, your programs are probably giving you the time to do that every day. So if there's anything you should be advocate, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for this. We need to be talking about reflection time for our staff, that we are on schedules that do not allow us to do this kind of process around kids and what we're seeing. Go. Um, there's, the process that we were all a part of is something that I've seen only very rarely happen to take the time in education. 
And what you just led us through was something from a book called um, From Another Angle, based on the Prospect Center of Back right. East, that reflective practice and the descriptive review. And I've seen centers that once they implement this process, it looks at the child as the individual for who they are and the label right. starts to go away. And we see a lot of advocacy for this out there in terms of like zero to three, a lot of groups are, are really pushing us toward this, but that it is, if we're gonna talk about sort of like effective interventions and, and effective staff people and real accountability, we've gotta have the time to do this. So this is just a little schematic that I put together to, to think about what this looks like for us. So educators stop so it is to stop and take the time to look. It is when you're caught up, I'm, I know this, that when I'm caught up in simply making sure the next activity, that, that the easel set up and the paints are there, you know, and, that, and I'm managing to get the food out, when that's all I do, I, I don't have the time to stop and to really look at what's going on. So you stop and you look, really take that time to look and you listen you know, you listen to what's going on, you write it down, you know, because you know, you need to take some, if we're gonna do this kind, of, I love what you just said about the different perspectives, and if we're gonna come together, you need to have sort of taken something that you can then share, to, this is what I saw. You know, that, that when Christopher was me, with me today, I saw this, and then someone else, well, I saw that, and I saw, you know, so it, so it is that, that taking notes. I know that in our desired results systems that we have all kinds of training about how, how we do that, and so I think that it's to really make, our, make ourselves do it. And then think. It is like, I think a lot of times that we, um, that we, we jump to action and so a lot of it is important to, to stop and have the time to, to think and then to meet, to talk. It is like, and at that table, I'm talking about staff, people, and parents to come together. What are we seeing? You know, what are we seeing? And then support the learning. And so frequently we go to support the learning. I mean, it's like, because we're all, we're, we're in early childhood educator people are, is that all the time I have? Oh my goodness, okay. This is just fun by here, you guys. So, we, um, so we, we move on to the action. And so I really do want us to support that. One of the things I've got to tell you that I, this was probably 10 years ago that I really got some people like Sue Bredekamp and Zero to Three, I really started listening about this. So what I try to do is when I'm at, say I'm at a table, Play-Doh table, I try to take a couple of minutes to just stop and really watch what's going on and go through this process a little in my head. And, and I, it's, it's amazing to me. I think I'm a better teacher because of it. I think, you know, I, I'm with, I teach kids now just once a week, two, threes, and fours, but I think I'm better than I used to be. And I think a lot of it is taking the time to stop and say, what's going on here? And so before I, before I intervene, you know, it's like with a Christopher, I watch a little and then I think about what I'm gonna do, you know? You think about that, that interaction that we're, um, we're gonna have. And um, I cannot believe that we only have 10 minutes here, so let me, <laughs> let me go on. Okay, now I wanna talk about this. I was gonna talk more about this. And I am a true believer in this, you guys. It is like, I'm a true believer because you know other states are looking at ours and saying this is what we, what we need. But our early learning and development foundations give a context for our observations and our reflective process and provide tools for meeting diverse needs. There is a context for this. So that when we talk about a Christopher or we talk about the other videos I was gonna show, they give us a context to sit down and say, what did we see and how does it look in relationships to the foundations? What do, what do we see here, you know, that in terms of this child? It's not, I think we get so caught up in having to turn in those desired results. And am I gonna finish every child? That we forget that there are contexts for our teaching. And so that, that's what I think in terms of your observations, your work, to really use this powerful instrument that we've got. And so that um, that context, context and tools. So here, and I'm gonna run through these. I'm not gonna go this, because I wanna get to something else here for you. I, this was gonna be a wonderful workshop, you guys. Unfortunately, you're not gonna get to experience it. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, here, I'm gonna go on here. I wanna get to this next part. 
Now, I'm gonna stop on this one, that um, because one of the participants came up and talked about her own child who is deaf and blind, and that I, this is this sort of progression, predictable direction, and I talked about the dog, and then the toy dog, and then the picture of the dog, and the dog, and she said her child, they never use pictures of dogs. And so one of the things about inclusive programs is you're looking at this developmental progression, you're looking how development occurs, and then you're looking at the individual child. And what are we going to need to move them through that developmental progression? And that's where I really do believe that the world of child development and early childhood special ed benefit one another. And too many people, and this is the olden days, this is long before people like Mary Falvey were teaching, and the olden days we had a lot of special educators that could do all kinds of interventions and didn't know the developmental progression. And right now we have too many teachers who know the developmental progression and don't need to know what to do with that child who's deaf and blind. So it's not a different progression. It's saying there's steps that we have to do differently to work through that. So let me, um, oh my God. You're gonna, in your evaluation of me, say he planned too much for what, um, what, what was there. So let me go on there. Now, this is in your handouts and you can look at it, but this is a format that I find very helpful. So that when you are looking at a child like Christopher or any child in your program, to think in terms of the domains and then to think what do we observe in the domain area? We talked about that, that's what we just did. We looked at things around his social emotional development, physical development, and language and literacy. And then what would be a targeted foundation? And it doesn't mean, I know you're responsible to cover everything, but when you're thinking about um, that you can't do everything all at once. And so that for Christopher, we talked about some things, you know, that I think may be targeted foundations for him. And so that I think it's clear in terms of his, his some, that we've, we've talked about the language and literacy. We've talked about some of the, um, the cooperation and the group stuff and whatever. So we use that. And then this next question is one I want to talk about. That should there be an IEP goal related to this foundation? There are lots of targeted foundations that don't need IEP goals. And I, I've talked about that, that with, uh, I mean, it is like when you read an IEP that has 75 goals and that, and that you think that, you know, unless we have all those 75 goals, we're not going to know what to do with this child. We have foundations and frameworks that help us know what to do with all children. And we need to be sharing those with families and other educators so they are aware of the richness of our program. And you need to be able to articulate that. It doesn't mean that the child needs an IEP goal for every single one of those or in all of those areas. So I think it is this matter of the foundations and the frameworks give us a tool. We should be able, with Christopher, to sit down and talk about all the foundations and where Christopher is. That's, we, we, we should be able to do that. But it does not mean that Christopher needs an IEP goal, even if he is a child with an IEP on all of those. And then I think it is, if an IEP goal is needed, what's an appropriate goal? So those are the questions I think we're, we're asking for those kids with, um, with disabilities. Now, Linda, help me here. I want to show one more, um, one more slide here that, um, okay, this is our system. You know, we've got the, um, the, our California Early Learning and Development System. We've got the foundations. We've got the curriculum frameworks. We've got the desired results. We've got professional development. We have program guidelines and resources. I think, my, this is Witt's opinion, that too often we jumble them all up and think they're the same thing, and they're not. They are not the same thing. And I, I think our K-12 system does better at this sometimes than we do in preschool. And that is, if you go and talk with a third grade teacher, not all, but most, you go and talk with a third grade teacher, that that third grade teacher can talk about standards-based or common core-based instruction. But they don't think that their assessment tool is the instruction or the standard. It's an assessment tool to measure the standard. I think we get confused in our, in our early learning program. And so here's, the, I mean, this is, um, here we go, what am I doing here? So you see that? This is at the heart of this. When we talk about standards-based or foundations, this is it. These other tools are helping us get there. 
But I think that you start here, and I'm afraid that too many people get so caught up in desired results, which is a great tool to look at foundations, but the foundations are themselves something that we all need to look at and know. So I urge you to take time with the foundations, with your staff and with families to understand that the, the desired results I love, I'm a big supporter of it, but it is a tool, it's an assessment tool to look at this and we need to get to this. The same way that people are talking about Common Core, the foundations align wonderfully with Common Core. Don't get mixed up about desired results aligning with Common Core. It's the foundations that align with Common Core. And if we talk about inclusive programs, they're the key to that. And, I, and it does, I'm not, I'm not um, belittling the, how hard it is to get all your work done. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that the foundations are at the heart of our work, and folks, that they're something you can own. I mean, I really do feel that you can understand them and own them. In the handouts, there, Mindy helped me, there's a wonderful, it's like, Mindy, it's like 10 pages, right, of, it's in the appendix, and it's just a wonderful tool that, Deborah, what, I just have to jump in and say bravo. And so CDE is standing here telling you he is 100% absolutely correct. And everything that he has said, I'm in the back going yes, yes, yes. And I agree, the desired results as an assessment tool has just taken over and become this thing that, that has been big and scary. And right. I know because I was in the classroom when that first came out and it was like, oh my gosh, we're assessing infants and toddlers, what are we doing? Right. So I totally get that and I understand it. And part of it is the assessment tool kind of came out before the foundations and everything else and so it became this, this big paperwork thing. But it, it does work and it's wonderful, but it fits in with what you talked about if you do it the right way. So desired results is the last thing you do. After you observe and you reflect and you gather all your data, bubbling in those little squares or the circles, that's the final thing. That's not the first thing. You don't do that first and then put it away. That's something that you do at the end of the cycle after you've taken in that information and done that reflection piece. And so it's very important to remember that. And when I was in the program and even today, if I walked into your classroom and I saw you sitting there doing nothing, that would be a good thing because you would be sitting and observing and watching. And that's what is important. But I know as a teacher how difficult that is. You can't just sit there and do nothing. You have a room full of children and you're a hard worker and you like to do things and we have things to do. And you know, so just to sit there and take that time to observe, whether you're documenting or not, um, is very important. And so, you know, you mentioned Bev Boss earlier, whom I love, but my other hero is Marta Gerber. And she reminded us right. to observe more and do less. Right. And so I just, I just want to reiterate everything that you've heard today and please go out and share with your colleagues and your friends because so often I see desired results being done incorrectly and becoming the burden that it's not supposed to be, but doing it correctly and utilizing the whole system, then you really do have a great tool and a great right. system for which California should be very proud of to really get to that reflective practice. So thank you. And I think that if there's one, and, and thank you so much, it is like so important that people hear that from you because I think there's mixed messages. But the, also I'm saying to you, all go out and advocate in your own programs about more time for this reflective practice. Absolutely. It is like, I think if there's anything, and I see, I've got to tell you, I don't want to get on too much of a soapbox here, but there are school districts and programs around the state that are using some of their um, local control funding formula and whatever to begin to build this in. And if we say, and which we're all saying now, it all starts in early childhood, it's the foundation. We need to allot times to make this happen. And I held you over, you guys, and I really do appreciate your attention. Thanks so well, much. Thank you. Yeah.